From Sunday, June 28th. Very pleasant this morning. We came 12 miles over very good roads through the mesquite brush to the Horsehead Crossing on the Pecos River, a nasty, dirty, muddy, ugly stream. Everything within two or three miles around is burned up with alkali, and the dead cattle lay thick on the banks of the river. We dip up the water and put it in the barrels for the dirt to settle to the bottom, then use the water for cooking and drinking. They have to take the horses two miles from camp to get grass. From June 29th. The men are crossing the wagons, then tie ropes long enough to reach across, then tie one end to the wagon tongue. Then the men swim and pull the wagons over. They tied four water barrels together, but put the decking plank on them and took most of our loads over on them. Some would pull and swim after and hold them. There are a company of Negro soldiers stationed here. Mrs. Kirkland, I, and children crossed in a skiff boat there. The Negroes brought the boat down where we were crossing and helped us to get the balance of our load over. They got everything across by four o'clock. The men are all very tired and half sick. They have been swimming the river backward and forward all day long. We are camped on the banks of the river between the river and a big alkali pond with just enough room for our wagons to stand between them. The herders have to swim back across the river to herd the horses. From June 30th, we reloaded our wagons and filled our water barrels with nasty, dirty water. We can see the dead cattle floating down while we are dipping up the water and see them lying on the banks all over. This is all we will have to drink for 87 miles. There is a man in camp now telling us there are 3,000 dead cattle in a canyon we have to go through this evening. We came 15 miles through a doleful-looking country with alkali dust three or four inches deep. Every now and then we would pass a pile of dead cattle, seven or eight in a pile, and it being a very warm evening, it was not a very pleasant trip, I tell you. We came through the long-dreaded canyon, but did not have half as much use for our camphor as we expected to. There were about 300 dead cattle from the river up instead of 3,000. The canyon is three miles through and very rocky. During these days, the Shacklefords were in the territories of the Lapan Apache and the Mescalero Apache. I'm Jen Globius, and this is the Halanaki Deep Dive, a podcast about the process of mapping and analysis for historical and archaeological research using open source tools. In this episode, I'll discuss the Shackleford's crossing of the Pecos River in West Texas at Horsehead Crossing and talk about a little bit about the history of that crossing. And then I'll also discuss the progress I'm making on following roads across Nebraska using the GLO maps. Let's dive in. So in this episode, I'm going to be talking a lot about the Pecos River, and the main source for a lot of the information you'll hear about today is a book by Patrick Deeren called Crossing Rio Pecos from 2012, and I'll put a link to the book to where you can find the book yourself in the show notes. Now, in western Texas, to get from east to west, you had to cross Rio Pecos, which was known for being treacherous because it had deep, swift water. Sometimes it would flood. And the water itself was not great to drink. It was often described as either briny or alkali. The river channel also had steep banks. So instead of gently sloping down towards the river, you had very perpendicular banks so that you would basically just come up to the river bank and there would be the river. And that made it very difficult to access to river. So instead of being able to drive a wagon down a slope and then cross, instead you would come directly to the river itself. And in addition to that, to also make things more treacherous, there was also quicksand in many places along the banks. So very treacherous, known for being difficult. Now, Due to difficulties with crossing the Pecos, so the steep banks and really swift water, only a few crossings were established, which were connected with various roads. The Shacklefords went across at Horsehead Crossing, one of these few crossings, and it was connected with the, up, what, with the road called the Upper Road. 
and it was also the path for the Butterfield Overland Mail Route. However, when the Butterfield Route first opened, the mail stage crossed at Pope's Crossing, another crossing, which was miles to the north because Horsehead was fairly treacherous. And it kept crossing there until August 1859, when the route was changed to Horsehead Crossing so that then the path would pass Fort Stockton and Davis, which would provide more protection for the mail route. And Horsehead Crossing was also known for raids by native tribes, by the indigenous peoples, since it was along what was called the Comanche Trail. So the Comanche would come from their northern homes and they would travel down to Mexico like almost annually to go raid there and then back. So the Horsehead Crossing was an important location for them. And so you had encounters between white people and indigenous tribes there and also other violence typical of the late 1800s. So the book Crossing Rio Pecos, the author spends a lot of time on different things you think of as typical with the old, with the, the wild west. So the cattle crossings that I'll talk about in a bit and outlaws and things like that. But in addition to all of the dangers posed by the river itself, there was also a really big lack of water to the east. So as Ruth Shackleford said in one of the entries I read in the intro, the Pecos River water, as nasty as it was, it was the only water they had for 87 miles as they headed east. And it just, it made life more difficult. So imagine if you're, so the Shacklefords were going from west to east, so they'd had other water, they hit the Pecos, and then they have Pecos water as the only water for 87 miles. But hopefully the water at the end was better. For people traveling from east to west, they'd have to go the 87 miles over the, the Llano Estacado, the Staked Plains, this desert, and then the only water you get is the nasty, salty Pecos River water, which would be awful. Now, this crossing of the Pecos River was known to be fairly treacherous. Like, they knew that it was a dangerous thing to do. And a few days before the entries I read, the Shackle and a few days before the Shacklefords reached Horsehead Crossing, while they were at Fort Stockton, their traveling party had divided into two. And the division occurred over which route to take. So would they continue on the Butterfield Trail? So go th- over the Pecos River at Horsehead Crossing, which was treacherous, and then they'd have miles of desert across the Llano Estacado. Or would they take a somewhat safer southern route, which would add 150 miles to the trip? Now, the entire party had decided on the southern route, but then Frank Shackelford at Gatewood and Mr. Kirkland, those three who were very much a unit, they had traveled together, their families had traveled together in 1865 from Missouri to California, and they continued to stay together and decided to go on that shorter route. While the families of Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Mr. Barton, who they were traveling with, decided to take the longer southern route. And I don't remember Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Barton being part of their trip in 1865. It might be that I'm wrong that they did travel with them then. But I wonder if Hamilton and Barton hadn't been part of their trip, and so they weren't as used to deserts. Although their entire group had crossed deserts going from Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, and now Texas. But those three, the Shacklefords, Gatewoods, and Kirklands, they had had this trip in 1868, but they had also had almost the much worse trip in 1865 when they went across Southern Utah, Nevada, and then California to reach San Bernardino. And I, I wonder if the Shackelfords, Gatewoods, and Kirklands were like, well, we kind of know what deserts are like. This is going to suck, but we can do it. And it's better to, we, we'd rather go the more direct route. We don't know that. But what I want to talk about and focus on a bit is that the thing that seemed to strike Ruth Shackelford the most, she talks about the some of the dangers of crossing the Pecos itself, like how they had to swim the wagons across, 
But what she focuses on, probably because it was shocking, was the number of dead cattle that were there. And Ruth's description of those dead cattle, dead livestock in the river is fairly graphic. Um, so graphic that Deeran quote, quoted her in his book, Crossing Rio Pecos. So it, it's great that he used Ruth Shackelford as a source. and But it's because she wrote very vividly about dead cattle floating in the river as the Shackelfords were gathering water into their barrels for their very long 78-mile stretch where they would have no other water. And that image made my stomach turn and it might yours as well. Um, And then as they are on the east side of the Pecos, then Ruth writes about seeing dead cattle in piles, like seven or eight in a pile. And while they only passed 300 dead cattle instead of 3,000 in the canyon east of the Pecos River, I mean, that just seems like it's a huge, huge, awful thing to pass. Like, just the smell. This is late June 1868, and just the smell of decomposing flesh is just gross. Now, one of the reasons why there were so many cattle in the area is because Horsehead Crossing was used for the Goodnight Loving Cattle Trail from the mid-1860s. And this was one of the many trails that were used to transport Texas Longhorns uh, north. Some of them are better known. They were further east, and they went up from Texas into Kansas like Abilene and Dodge. This was the westernmost trail, and... It was used to take Texas Longhorns to either New Mexico or Colorado or perhaps up into Wyoming. And these long-distance cattle drives continued until railroads were built into Texas, so it was no longer necessary to drive the cattle, uh, thereby losing uh, some of the weight of the cattle. But these cattle drives were still ongoing in June of 1868 when the Shackelford's party crossed the Pecos River. In the last episode, I introduced you to the Diary of Harriet Bunyard, which is the next diary in the Covered Wagon Women, Volume 9, after Ruth Shackelford's 1868 diary. Harriet Bunyard and her family traveled from Texas to California, partly along the reverse of the Shackelford's route, so going the opposite direction. And so I had looked at Harriet's description of the crossing of the Pecos from June 15th, 16th, and 17th. And so here's an excerpt from those pages. So from June 15th, arrived at the river early in the afternoon. Nothing had suffered for water. June 16th, the Pecos is narrow, deep and muddy stream with no timber on its bank. It is now level with the banks, very bad tasted water. There is a skiff that the mail is crossed in and we have permission to cross our things in it. And then paraphrasing what else happened during June 16th, they lost one mule during the crossing. And then after everything was across, um, Harriet's brother Dan and a man named Ed Stewart decided to swim across the river after the cattle and the horses had crossed. But they almost drowned when Ed's leg cramped and then Dan had to try to save him. So remember, the Pecos River was pretty swift and it had currents in it. The crossings made by the Shackelfords and Bunyards is similar. From parts I didn't read, there's a company of black soldiers noted in both of these entries, and they helped both parties cross with a small boat, getting the women and some of the goods across. Then wagons are floated across, and then the livestock are herded. But reading this, what struck me is that Harriet didn't mention dead cattle at all. There's no mention of it of dead cattle. It's just the crossing is very treacherous, but then they're on the other side. And it's something that struck Ruth so vividly. So it was June 16th, like the date that the Bunyards crossed was June 16th. And the Shackelfords crossed the Pecos River at June 29th. And so I I just started to wonder, like, Did Harriet not write about the dead cattle because it was commonplace to her experience living in Texas, but the dead cattle were shocking to Ruth Shackelford, who was not from the area and wasn't used to seeing such a thing? So 
it may be that that's the case, that their different experiences um, change whether they were shocked or not. But there's actually another factor at play here. And this is the case, even though the routes of the Bunyards and the Shacklefords seem to be the same, so they're just going in reverse from Barilla Station to at least Castle Gap east of the Pecos River. So that's the canyon that the Shacklefords go through at the end of the entries I read. But what's going on, even though these, these routes seem very similar just from reading it, the two parties cross the river at different points, even though they seemingly took the same route. And the reason why the crossing was different actually involves a clarification I need to make for an error I made in the last episode, not knowingly. So in the episode about Barilla Station, I wondered if Ruth was referring to the Bunyard's group when she was fairly, um, when she was commenting about people traveling from Texas to California to the land of gold, they think, as she said. So saying these people are are somewhat foolish, thinking that going to California is going to solve their problems. So I thought that perhaps the two groups had like crossed paths. And I based this idea on a footnote by the editor of Covered Wagon Women, who said that the two women passed each other. That footnote was wrong. The editor had it wrong. While reading Crossing Rio Pecos, I learned that Harriet Bunyard's diary was also published in another volume called Ho for California, Women's Overland Diaries from the Huntington Library, edited by Sandra Myers. And I'll put a link to that book in the show notes as well. So it was published in another volume. And I also learned that Harriet Bunyard traveled from Texas to California in 1869, not 1868. And I checked if this information was correct. I looked at online calendars for 1868 and 1869. And the only days that Harriet, like Ruth, like distinguishes from the other with the name of the day of the week is Sundays. And you can check to see that the date of Sundays in Harriet Bunyard's diary match up with 1869 not 1868. I did then go double check like Ruth Shackelford's diary and her Sundays match up for 1868. So the Shackelfords and the Bunyards did not cross paths as I had speculated about in the previous episode. And this means that despite the similarities in their descriptions of crossing the Pecos River, Ruth and Harriet cross the river at different crossing points. And this is because the crossing for the road changed soon after the Shacklefords crossed the Pecos at the end of June 1868. Due to the dangers of crossing the, crossing the river at Horsehead Crossing, both from the river itself, the steep banks, the quicksand, dealing with indigenous native peoples, U.S. Army Captain F.S. Dodge was sent out from Fort Stockton to scout out a safer crossing of the Pecos for travelers. This was early in the summer. On July 1st, 1868, so days after the Shackelfords crossed at Horsehead Crossing, Colonel Edward Hatch ordered that the mail route no longer use Horsehead Crossing, but cross further south near the Pecos Mail Station, where, later that summer, the army built a ferry across the river. The new crossing was named, was called Pontoon, because a pontoon bridge was built there in 1870. And so shortly after the Shackelfords crossed, the route changed further south. And by 1869, that is the route that the Bunyards would have taken to cross the Pecos River as they headed to California from Texas. So it's unknown. The difference between Ruth Shackelford and Harriet Bunyard's descriptions of dead cattle at the Pecos River, it could be because of their different experiences, but it also could be because they crossed at different points of the Pecos River. I don't know, but I suspect that the cattle drives still continued at Horsehead Crossing, but that difference may just come from uh, because they went across the river at different places. So now, to update you about my progress on mapping, um, I spent some time last week georeferencing the BLM General Land Office uh, survey plats that show the wagon road on the south side of the Platte River. So this is the route that stages would have taken and also that the Shacklefords traveled on in 1865. 
And so I was able to georeference all of the maps across Nebraska. Not all of them show the road, but usually there's only one in between that doesn't have the wagon route listed. And so I'll be able to digitize in between. Nebraska is completely done. But then I was like, hey, let's look and see if it continues into Colorado as the South Platte goes. And it does. It seems to. Again, the same thing. Some of the maps don't have the wagon road. It's not as well marked as in Nebraska, but it I can mostly follow it along the South Platte and now into um, following the Cache La Poudre, which is what the, the Shacklefords followed to then head north towards Wyoming. So I'm still working on georeferencing those maps. Once I can no longer follow that route, the next steps for this for this work is to digitize the route. So draw the actual lines for the wagon road. And then to go through and look at Ruth Shackelford's diary entries and probably look at um, Sarah Raymond Herndon's description of their stops as well in her diary, uh, Days on the Road, and then create points which would be potential places where the Shackelford stopped based on Ruth and Sarah's entries about their wagon train. Now, of course, the stops located that I'm going to put points in will have a lot of uncertainty. But because I can place them on a road, so that reduces the amount of uncertainty. And so I'll probably end up classifying them as uncertain and not very uncertain since there's at least somewhat control. We won't know exactly where along the road they would have stopped, but we know that it was on the road at least. So in this episode, I told you a bit about the horsehead crossing of the Pecos River. And if you want to learn more, I do highly, highly recommend Patrick Deeren's book, Crossing Rio Pecos, which you can find the link in the, in the show notes. I also want to emphasize the importance of checking sources, even or especially when it's in an edited volume. Now, you would think that possibly if you're working with a, a primary source, like directly with the original, you'd be like, okay, so I need to figure out if dates and things actually work. And that's also true when editors, when other people are involved, since we're not working with original documents, since editors are not infallible. And I've gotten a lot of really interesting and good information in the footnotes provided by the editor of Covered Wagon Women, but not all that information is correct. Um, as in episode three, when he had identified the location of Dogtown incorrectly. So he was using other information, but he hadn't checked it closely enough. And he actually, I think if he had tried to map it, it would have made more sense that the location given for Dogtown was too far south to actually be the Shackleford's route. And I think that emphasizes the importance of determining location. So figuring out where all these things happen can really illuminate issues like this in some cases, but also it allows, it'll allow me to provide more context to bring in other things because location will also be part of the, the information. Thanks for listening. Email questions or comments to deepdive at helenaki.com or ask them on the Helenaki Deep Dive Facebook page. Show notes with links to resources mentioned in this episode are available at helenaki.com. That's H-E-L-O-N-A-K-I.com. You can also find ways to support the show at helenaki.com slash support. The Helenaki Deep Dive is written and produced by me, Jen Globius of The Helenaki. The theme music is Deep Ocean Instrumental by Dan O of danosongs.com. Thanks for listening.